What we have here is the Amira Source Bergen Investor Day deck. It's 65 pages, and I believe since uh, this was published, they have rebranded to a company called Sancora. The date of this is June 1st, 2022, and right now we're currently in October 20. October 2023. So it is a bit over a year now since they published this. However, I think it still gives us, uh, going through this will give us a good idea of their vision for the company, their operations, and, and also it gives us a chance to evaluate the financials and the management discussion to see how they have compared uh, to what they set out in this deck on the states. Okay, so here we have the leadership team. So here is an individual that holds both well, pretty much all three most powerful positions in the company. You have him as the chairman of the board and you have him as the president and CEO. Ideally, uh, we would like to see some better governance, you know, where you have separate individuals for the president, the chairman, and the CEO, but different companies have different reasons for doing it. We'll see what that reason might be. So here we have Silvana. So we have not too many individuals on our leadership team compared to other companies like Henry Schein, which could be a good indication, right? There's a focus of power, there's a focus of vision, and execution may be easier to deliver compared to having too many cooks in the kitchen. And we serve as a key pillar in the global healthcare system at our scale, expertise, and extensive network of customers and partners allow us to play a key role in supporting access, innovation, and improved outcomes. Their revenue is very good, over $200 billion, over 42,000 global members, and you know, is that full-time employees or is that contractors, the liability for each is very different to the company. Over 600 global offices and over 75 countries. So let's take a quick look at what their stock price is trading at right now. So they're at about $190 um, per share as of October 24th, 2020, 2023. And uh, you know, at least on Google, it shows that their market cap is $8.4 billion. Which is surprising, right? You have Henry Schein, which is doing significantly less. I think almost a tenth, or less than a tenth, of the revenue that they're doing. Uh, I think about half of the staff, and they're at a market cap that's slightly higher compared to Sancora or you know, you know, as they're known right now is Amerisaurus Bergen. It'd be good to understand a bit more. You know, are these even comparables, right? Even though they are both in the healthcare system, are they comparables? Why is it that their market cap is only eight billion? Is it because the multiples are lower, or is it that the multiple for Henry Shine is uh, much higher than it should be? Connecting providers and biopharma manufacturers, our scale. Okay, so we talked about that. So I think here they talk about uh, what their business is. So they are in a distribution business as well as things. Right, similar to Henry Shine and complementary solutions. Okay, so I think uh, what it's doing is that it's acting as the middle person between the biopharma manufacturers and providers, uh, which I'm assuming are the physicians. So for biopharma manufacturers, we have uh, they offer health, economics, and market access consulting, marketing and communications, global storage, and transfer solutions. This is pretty interesting. I mean, the first two, it's more of a service, it's more right fee for service, which, you know, to the degree of risk is that, you know, if the key person or the account manager or uh, the person delivering that consulting does leave, what is that risk of the revenue? And then we have channel strategy advisory. What does that mean? Data and analytics. This, I would imagine, is becoming more and more of importance given the rise of AI, machine learning. I think people can do much more with data and analytics than what they could do even five, 10 years ago. And I'd be interested to know how are they capitalizing on this trend and improving the revenue under this service point. And then they have patient access, affordability, and here we have patient access, affordability, and here's services. Uh, what does that mean, right? Is it is it that patients are not adhering to their drug plans and their recovery or their prognosis is not on the track that the doctors are expecting or the drug uh, manufacturers are expecting, given the price point that the drugs are at, is it that if the adherence programs are better, the effectiveness of the drugs uh, will be at a higher, right? They're getting more bang for their buck effectively. So I'm not exactly sure what that means. So I think it's good to look, take a deeper dive into that terminology. The providers, they are offering patient experience solutions and insights, GPO services. I'm not sure exactly what GPO services are. Let's take a quick look. GPO services and a GPO based on uh, the terminology here. What we're seeing is a group purchasing organization is an entity that helps healthcare providers such as hospitals, nursing homes, and home health agencies 
realize savings and efficiencies by aggregating purchasing volume and using that leverage to negotiate discount with manufacturers, distributors, and other vendors. So it seems that what they're doing here is they're representing uh, buying groups in the provider on the provider's front uh, and they're acting as a middleman and negotiator with the biopharma manufacturers to get a better price. And then you have operational financial performance solutions, product value and access optimization, regulatory and legislative support. Here where you know they're using terminology solutions, which is in some ways a bit vague, right? Is it a consulting service or is it do they have a proprietary infrastructure or technology that allows them to deliver the service and solutions, acts as a barrier to entry or uh, deterrence against competitors into their market, right? If it's purely consulting, then it is uh, you know the revenue is pretty weak uh, because as good the revenue is to them it's as much of a liability if the providers of those solutions transition or move into a different company or even start their own consultancy. You see that pretty often with bigger companies is that these individuals with actual client relationships, they feel very frustrated and they feel a bit confined. And you know, at a certain stage in their career, they decide to move out on their own and taking a lot of clients with them. And they survive on you know one, two, or three you know meaningful clients. And that potentially is a risk factor. So you're seeing that both on the provider's side Right, insights and solutions. We have regulatory legislative support and as well as consulting, right? So both sides of the market. It seems that they're delivering services to you, there is a bit of that risk. But I'm I'm assuming given the size of revenue and given the relationships they have as a corporate entity, uh, there's a lot of value that is, you know, that is intrinsically tied to the organization itself, right? I mean I think the amount of doors that they can open on the regulatory and legislative front, the lobbying that they can do. Uh, is a lot more than what a smaller shop or individual can do, even if they were to leave. Embedded leadership competencies advance talent and culture. So we have DE and I collaboration, innovation, and excellence. Uh, purpose. Okay, so they're talking about the people. They're talking about diversity. The fact that it's on slide nine at the very top of a sixty-five page slide deck indicates that this is very important to them. Uh, here we have is taking decisive steps to build on foundational uh, on foundation for growth. We have continued to take significant steps to build on our foundation, including reinforcing the strengths of our culture and operating model by investing in our talents. Uh, this is very good. You know, I think we have to think about, you know, in what way are they thinking about talent beyond diversity, are they investing or they're empowering them? And this is very key, right? Because ultimately it is also the people that drive the company to, to a very large degree. Uh, the execution is very important and aligned organization to support growth and innovation. Okay. Leveraging our commercial strengths and intellectual confidence to create solutions for new stakeholder challenges. Delivering strong financial results powered by our ability to innovate and execute. How are you doing that? Uh, supported by the inherent resilience of our business. Okay, so this is an interesting comment, right? I mean, in one way, uh, it may be the fact that their business is very resilient, but however, if their confidence is coming from the current resilience of their business, uh, that potentially may be a red flag, right? Because uh, you don't want to be too complacent. So I think having a bit more clarity on their you know, building and their track record and their vision to innovate and executing on that on the basis of their current business, right? Their current resilience of their business, that could be very good, right? So it'd be interesting to see how they are thinking about innovation, how they are thinking about their current business position. Expanding role as a differentiated global partner in pharmaceutical solutions through acquisition of Alliance Healthcare. Biopharmaceutical innovation continues to create opportunities for us to capitalize on our leading specialty capabilities. Okay, what are these capabilities? Biopharmaceutical advancement and innovation. Uh, for innovation, we have growth in specialty, gene therapy, digital therapeutics, and targeted therapies. Biopharma manufacturer trends. Uh, the number of new drug launches by small and mid-sized biotech. Okay, so here we have is the, the graph showing projected global. Here we have projected global specialty spending as percentage of total drug spending. We have global, which is projected global specialty spending. Okay, so the, as a percentage of total drug spending, this is the percentage of the specialty drug spending. And I think uh, we have to understand what exactly are specialty drugs, right? How, how does an Advil differ, differ from other more generic drugs so i think we have to get that understanding to really evaluate this but you know the trend is promising the trend is interesting right going from a low of 
24%, all the way up to 45 to 50 or even 60% as of uh, the next two years. So the trajectory is very high. Uh, so I think we can understand, you know, why is that happening? Is it that specialty drugs is more receptive? You know, is it a result of lobbying? Is it the result of other dynamics that is not really related to the result and performance of the drugs, right? So I think we have to take a look at that. And, you know, why is it happening now versus 10, 20 years ago? Additional external trends are creating opportunity, managing total cost of care. So we have the external trends, and this may be the trends that they're noticing for the overall industry, right? And I think that is the case. I mean, we've seen this with other companies, biosimilars. I mean, that's been a very exciting topic for the past 10 years at the very least. Now we have virtual care. You know, this took off quite a bit in during COVID, with, especially with behavioral health. I've seen massive increases in performance with mental health groups growing rapidly from New York to California to Florida to Texas. So this is something that is definitely the case. So just going through the one by one, managing total cost of care. This is a highlight we have to get this cost under control for for a lot of individuals for you know the population as a whole cost burden rising public health care and patient out-of-pocket expenses so what i've seen on the behavioral market uh, behavioral health market is that in the major metropolitan areas like new york city and also california texas you are seeing more and more providers moving out of network just because the reimbursement rates is so low i think for new jersey new york uh, you're looking at you know, a, a typical session for with a psychologist as low as eighty dollars per session for forty five minutes, but then if they're out of network, they're charging the patients out of pocket two twenty two fifty, uh, as high as four hundred dollars per session uh, for the really high and you know well known and qualified individuals. So that is a concern, uh, but at the same time, that really only happens for those that are at the same time. The cost also really happens only for those that have the income, the financial means to afford that. On the flip side though, if you're in network, the wait times are a lot longer. With behavioral health, the wait list was you know, easily up to months at a time, certain geographies in, in the US, in different US uh, areas. So uh, regardless, this is an issue that we are seeing. Biosimilars, growing generic and biosimilar alternatives offering cost relief, yes, contracting, increasing interest, uh, value-based contract agreements, digital transformation, shifting models, and sites of care. Virtual care, we talked about engagement models, increasing the use of digital solutions, transforming traditional methods. Yes, drug development, promising digital technologies to transform pharma productivity. This is this could potentially be very interesting. Uh, there was a company that I saw in Europe many years ago, actually, and I think to the degree that how successful it was, you know, perhaps the, the technology at the time wasn't there yet, but their thesis was that where you have uh, these initial drugs going to phase one, phase two, and phase three, they often call, at least what I heard is that the phase two is what they call the value, value of death. So what happens is that a lot of these phase two drugs, they don't pass the clinical trials, so they are no longer applicable, right? So they're kind of dead in waters, and what their technology did at the, did at the time is they... Uh, they will evaluate these biomarkers in these uh, in the individuals and see how receptive these drugs might be, where these field drugs might be to these people or individuals with a certain biomarker. So in that case, they could um, redesign the clinical trial with individuals or with patient test population that has a higher affinity or efficacy to the failed drugs, and they would buy these drugs at a very cheap rate compared to you know, if they have passed phase two trials into phase three, and then once they, they get phase two to pass, they would then sell off to the big pharma. So, you know, it's something that I looked at very briefly. That was their thesis. Last I looked several years back, three, four years back, you know, they haven't, uh, it didn't seem like their company really got anywhere, but perhaps a pharmacist, perhaps a researcher can actually look at this and see and take that technology a bit further. So that was five, seven years ago. Perhaps the technology, the software is different now. Perhaps there is a lot more opportunities to develop drugs, you know, redevelop and retry phase two failed drugs and perhaps hopefully lowering the cost of, of drug innovation. Evolving market dynamics, outsourcing, continue outsourcing of process steps by 
uh, drug companies' data and analytics, growing need for solutions that enable better real-time decisions, government evolving role of government evolving role with government agencies to ensure access, quality, and integrity. Clearly, we saw what happened with drug development for COVID over the past in the past two years. So they can definitely have a role in drug development, and I think we have to see more of that for data and analytics. Uh, we talked about that earlier with the rise of AI and machine learning. I think there's um, you know, there's a lot of things that could be done in the next little while, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that we couldn't even fathom five years ago, and now ChatGPT is coming out with you know, MidJourney and all these different AI uh, options, and it'd be interesting to see how that can be applied to the medical space. Creating differentiated value for our stakeholders, our long-term sustainable growth is supported by investments in our people and culture and commitment to ESG. Alliance Healthcare Acquisition okay, supports Continued advancement of our business and strategic initiatives. This seems to be more of a strategic investment. Lead with market leaders, expands relationships with key anchors, anchor customers, and adds Boots UK and leading network of European independent pharmacies. That'd be very interesting, right? The network of European independent pharmacies. How big is this network? Are they saying that they own the pharmacies now, right? Do they own distribution channels in this case? Leverage infrastructure to increase efficiency and support our customers in meeting consumer needs. Adds a complementary portfolio of leading distribution, commercialization, and provider services to provide a comprehensive suite of solutions across global footprint and benefit from economies of scale. It'd be interesting to hear more about what their infrastructure actually looks like, the geographic dispersion of the infrastructure, right? Is it global? Is it only in select major markets? Expand on leadership in specialty adds capabilities to support specialty distribution and commercialization in Europe. Okay, so that seems to be a focus of theirs. Perhaps what it's saying is that, perhaps what it's saying here is that the, or this acquisition alone is more focused on the US and, or this acquisition is more focused on the European market. They have a really good and strong American market or North American infrastructure market, and this helps them expand globally and have a strong presence in Europe. Contribute to drug and prescription outcomes, enhance the ability to support pharmaceutical distribution reach, and expands global pharm- biopharma services portfolio and footprint. This could make a lot of sense if I'm understanding this correctly, right? If they are actually owning the pharmacy network, and they are able to distribute, they are able to provide the distribution and support the manufacturers in ways significantly better than had they not or if they do not own the pharmacies themselves, right? But that also introduces a whole network or a whole new level of issues of actually only pharmacies as that might be a very different business compared to them acting as a distributor right now, right? Perhaps having your hands in too many boxes at the same time, being come becoming too diversified, that might have its own liability as well. Invest in innovation to further drive differentiation, strengthens platforms to provide innovative solutions for global partners. Uh, overall, my initial thinking is that, you know, after going through 15 slides so far, I'm not getting a whole lot of concrete examples or concrete methods on why they are the company to do a lot of things that they're doing, right? Uh, how are they providing these consulting services? How are they providing these di- distribution services? Why is it that they're able to generate a 200 billion plus revenue on an annual basis? And what I'm looking from this is that if their access, if the access that they provide is unparalleled, if the efficiency and reliability is unparalleled, that is the competitive advantage that they have over everyone else, right? Because if you get to a certain size uh, of business, that becomes that does become an advantage that you can hold over other people. And it will be good to understand a bit more, you know, if that is the case and how are they defending that? How are they preventing others coming in and chipping away at their market share in lower value services or lower value verticals that they're in? How do, how do they prevent that? Foundation of leadership in pharmaceutical distribution, differentiated by complementary higher margin and high growth businesses, driving sustainable long-term growth by enhancing our commercial solutions and advancing innovation to facilitate future of healthcare. Here, they're saying that they are differentiated by complementary higher margin and higher growth businesses. So is it that there are comparable companies out there that is prever- uh, providing a similar but not quite the same level of access and efficiency and reliability but the reason why customers and or their customers would choose Amerisource Bergen is more so related to the other services that were 
three services that they're offering on top of their foundational value proposition. Is that the reason? And if so, is it hot? So if it is higher margin, right, does that mean they're charging an unreasonable amount to their customers, right? So I think these two, having their foundation you know, business and how do they execute on uh, the higher margin products and services, that is that is very key, right? Because if the value proposition in this case, you are differentiated or your value proposition above other companies is the complementary uh, services and their higher margin, then it's also a bit contradictory, right? But if your advantage is, if you're differentiated, if you're, concrete advantage is the access, the efficiency, the reliability, that gives you the ability to charge higher margin, higher growth business, you know, offer, offerings to your clients. But if this is the reason why they're choosing you, you know, your advantage goes away very quickly if someone else comes in with the same service and offering at a lower margin. So that's something that we have to think about a bit more closely. Advancing our long-term vision, deliver long-term sustainable growth by maintaining leading share of pharmaceutical distribution and best in class efficiency while growing high margin in high growth businesses within our US and international reportable segments. What are the non reportable segments? Right? Interesting that they would use that language. Strategic imperatives to deliver our vision, global base of key anchor customers across all segments, supporting patient access wherever a prescription is needed. Okay, so the Rx, the prescription, that seems to be very central to their business. Okay, so this is something we have to look more into. Right. How are they integrating with their operations and workflows? Right? Is it that they are simply the prescription, you know, middleman or distributor between these individuals? Are they really just, you know, are they just the the logistics or the transport company that delivers the drugs from point A to point B? Or is it that they have more of a proprietary software where they have a platform that is actually integrated, that is actually truly integrated with animal health with community physicians, with government agencies, right? I mean, are they ordering their drugs? Uh, are they actually managing their workflows on a solution that is provided by the bio, you know, by, by Amerisaurus Bergen? Or is it just that if they need a certain drug, they call up Amerisaurus uh, Bergen and they deliver it? That's something we have to look into. I think just looking back at one of the other slides, they were saying that they also provide GPO services, which is the group purchasing organizations, if they are able to represent these individuals that also achieves economies of scale to have more negotiating power with the biopharma manufacturers, right? So the biopharma companies, they need Amerisource Bergen for a distribution. And uh, the guys down here in the downstream, they need Amerisource Bergen for their ability to negotiate uh, with the bio manufacturers, right? So uh, it'd be interesting to know, you know, what are the com com what is the competition out there, how easy it is to detach and decouple from Amerisaurus Bergen on both the upstream and downstream. And that will give us an indication of you know, how tied and how recurring, how strong the revenue is. Providing services and solutions in key channels, biopharma manufacturers, community physicians. Okay, so these are different delivery points and this is the upstream that we just saw up here. And then we have the downstream uh, delivery channels over here. So they offer health economics and market access consulting global storage and transfer solutions, channel strategy advisory. Uh, so I would imagine that this is advising biopharmas on, effectively if all, the, all of these individuals or entities are the customers of Marisource Bergen, there's a lot of insights that they can generate from, from the distribution channels, right? I mean, how is the pattern? I mean, how it, you know, what is, what is the cyclicality of certain drugs? How is it being dispensed? How is it being uh, prescribed? And if they have the access to the data, they can run different models on the data to make certain predictions. That could be very interesting, right? And here we have data analytics, right? Perhaps is giving them insight into the different channels downstream and helping them form decisions and direction on what type of drugs to develop, you know, how to make alterations. That is very valuable. Patient access, affordability, and adherence services. We talked about this earlier. What is adherence services and how does it benefit the bio pharma manufacturers? Clinical trial support. I think this is the delivery and perhaps this is how to implement the clinical trials through community pharmacies or community offices, physicians, right? Something to look into a bit more. You know, I know that there's certain companies out there where they are physician offices, they are pharmacies, but operational cash flow from that itself is breaking even or they're losing money. But at the same time, they are conducting these clinical trials and that's actually where the majority of the revenue is coming from or that's where 
the majority of the profitability is coming from. And then for our community and specialty pharmacy, we have generics purchasing, business coaching, pharmacies, ownership services, branding, and marketing. Okay, so this seems to be a lot like a business consulting service to uh, these pharmacies, inventory management, clinician education, data capabilities. Okay, so again, this seems to be very much like consulting, health systems and specialty, full line and specialty distribution, data analytics capabilities, pharmacy solutions, dose packaging, inventory storage and management, animal health, companion, per management. So overall, it seems that the services that they are offering, it's not really tied, at least from at face value right now, it's not really tied to any intrinsic software or technology or IP. I mean, there might be processes that trademarks uh, certain uh, offerings, consultant, consulting packages that is uh, trademarked or IP, right? I mean, there are there's that possibility. But at the same time, it seems that the true value, you know, as far as I can tell right now, the true value proposition that they're offering is from its scale and uh, diversity of its offerings, right? I mean, the customers that they serve offers them value to other services, right? So it's almost acting as a marketplace in some ways where there is network effects and the value is coming from uh, the participants of this network. And, you know, once you reach a certain scale, it is very difficult to topple. Uh, it is very difficult to disrupt. But when it does, it could happen very quickly. And I think there are parallels that we can draw from the social network industry with MySpace, with Friendster, for example, where these, uh, you know, these platforms that came much early on prior to Facebook. And that could happen, and this, that dismantling could happen very quickly. Uh, so I think, you know, whether or not they are an investable platform, we really have to look at, you know, what are uh, what are some of the areas of vulnerabilities? Are there competitors and how are they doing? And if the moment that there are, essentially if there are com competitors of equal or similar size, that could be problematic for, you know, for this company. Our infrastructure is efficient and technology enabled. Not exactly what this is trying to show. So here we have a case study supporting the needs of veterinarian customers. Uh, so we have the pet portal, teletriage, digital marketing, digital check-in, home delivery fulfillment. That's interesting, right? Are they providing financing themselves or are they acting as the brokers? Uh, Amir Service Bergen. Automated reminders, that's pretty important. These are all good, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that are that are trying to do this, right? There's uh, the EMR HR space. It's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very fragmented one, but it's also not a very good one, right? I mean, I've seen uh, clinics uh, across whether it's optometry or primary care, mental health, a lot of the platforms they're using is really, you know, it's really bad. And, you know, the solutions on the market either is very expensive. I mean, there are good ones, but I think what I'm trying to say here is why is it that they are offering, what is it about their platform that makes a customer want to use this? How disruptive is it? Do they have the same access to engineers and quality of engineers and software developers as uh, Silicon Valley, California startups, right? Because uh, this is an issue that they're, it seems that they're trying to solve. And uh, perhaps the approach is very different, right? Perhaps they're trying to provide a better software from an infrastructure, from a scale perspective, less so from the user experience, uh, less so from how good the software itself is, which is likely the approach of the startup, you know, a venture back company, you know, they're probably more focused on the quality of the software itself. Whereas, you know, no matter how good the UX is, UI is, uh, perhaps, you know, the thinking here is that if their platform is intrinsically and inherently connected with their overall infrastructure real world, that is going to provide a better value proposition compared to just better technology, right? And I think this comes down to even the Apple or iOS and Android comparison, right? I mean, oftentimes you find newer and better technologies on Android phones but at the same time, people that are using Apple don't really care that much, right? They're even happy to pay uh, the premium, the Apple tax for that experience in comparison to Android, just because that infrastructure, that ecosystem is really solid, is there, is reliable. And maybe that's the case. Maybe that is the approach that they, they're taking here. So they don't have to worry about getting the best developers. They don't have to worry about building the best software as long it provides a more seamless integration with their overall value proposition that all their customers are already on. Case study supporting the needs of health system customers, uh, health systems, purchasing optimization, set of care strategy, product and payer access solutions, drug 
shortage mitigation. Okay. Broadest portfolio of leading specialty solutions, expanding our suite of solutions to build on our position as a partner of choice. Globally scale logistics in 3PL services, wholesale and pre wholesale in 15 countries. Uh, why is it only in 15 countries, right? Because uh, I um, wholesale and pre wholesale in 15 countries. Why is it only in 15 countries? Uh, I think uh, from earlier slides, they were in over 75 countries. Is there cross selling opportunities or does the logistics system or the infrastructure for transport uh, isn't developed enough for them to enter the other countries? possible. Clinical trial logistics in over 50 countries with direct to patient capabilities, temperature control and order monitoring, clinical and commercialization services, market access and regulatory consulting. This is very interesting given the scale of their customer base and the diversity of their customer base. This is a very strong offering clinical trial support, data and analytics. It's interesting that I'm not sure if I've seen the machine AI or machine learning yet, but this is, you know, that is key, right? I mean, I think that's the trend, that is the pop popular uh, terminology. So I'm curious to understand why they're not using that terminology and instead of using uh, perhaps a bit more dated term of data and analytics. Leader in specialty distribution, leadership in oncology and ophthalmology, GPO solutions, physician education, and inventory management. Supporting pharmaceutical innovation across clinical and commercialization journey, approval, Okay, we have the approval, accessibility, coverage, provider experience, payment, and patient access uh, and adherence. Okay, so let's just go through one by one. Global clinical trial logistics, you know, I think as much as the same, you know, I think what I'm getting from this is that, you know, they are the partner of choice, or they're trying to position themselves as the partner of choice at every stage of the pharmaceutical life cycle, from the development of it to deploying it, to getting market access, to helping customers uh, pay for it even, and as well as ensuring that patients are adhering, right? So I guess that's what this is about, right? If they are being prescribed, but the patients are not using it, uh, that will naturally decrease the demand for that drug. But if the adherence is, you know, strong, if they are following that, you know, that regimen of uh, prescription, then there is a con, you know, there is constant demand or there is continued demand for that, uh, for that drug. So they are, that's really good, right? That's a value proposition that not many companies, you know, likely not many companies out there are able to offer. Specialty strategy in action, cell and gene therapy. Okay, strategic vision, we are the partner of choice for advancing therapy manufacturers, including for cell and uh, cell and gene therapy, logistics, global liquid nitrogen charging network, growing cry cryo storage capabilities, track cell and gene therapy orchestration platform, manage cell and gene therapy product journey from patient enrollment to infusion, leveraging robust pharmaceutical logistics assets and patient support programs, create a best in class end to end product ecosystem, leverage unique position at intersection of biopharma and providers, insights and data for value-driven contracting, okay, because the manufacturer, patient population, okay. In biopharma market, market trend, total addressable market for outsourced biopharma manufacturer services is attractive at over 100 billion and growing at 5 to 10% per annum. Uh, already said that, I think that's what it is. Uh, outsourced biopharma manufacturer services. So what does that mean, right? So what are the services that are being met, uh, outsourced? Small and mid-sized pharma typically outsource more and lead to new drug approvals. Okay, let's take a look at the market distribution. You know, how fragmented is it? Uh, what is the distribution of the bigger companies versus the small and mid-sized pharma? Do they have the budget for it? What does the capital market look like? Just because, you know, from my understanding, the small and mid-sized pharma, you know, they are heavily reliant on uh, the capital markets, right? They are actively raising money in the public markets and they're using that for drug development. And from the looks of it, that is, uh, you know, that is where a good portion or a portion of the budget is going to. And I think given the past two years uh, since COVID, uh, or, you know, the past two years, there ha the capital markets hasn't been doing too well with the interest rate regime uh, in North America and potentially in a lot of other countries as well globally. Uh, so given the limited capital market access, given in that potentially implies a limited uh, budget, how has that affected, uh, you know, their revenue stream, right? So... Let's take a closer look. Large pharma increasingly interested in outsourcing in smaller markets to reduce burden of overhead cost. I can understand that, right? If they are in smaller markets, the overhead cost is probably going to be still the safety setup. Uh, you know, the things that they want to do, they might as well, you know, outsource because uh, there is the possibility of something's not working out, right? If they make that investment, there's also closing costs or shutdown costs. Uh, why not? And perhaps it might make sense to pay a bit of a premium to, to you know, a company like Amerisource Bergen. Um, but the expected value or the expected cost is still going to be lower compared to making that direct investment 
themselves. Decision making more global, more cross functional groups, particularly for specialty drug launches. Okay. The mayor source Bergen's differentiating strength, strong reputation, and customer relationships across large pharma and small and mid sized pharma in both the United States and Europe. Okay. That has been emphasized many times. Geographic footprint across the US and Europe, including distribution and select consulting service capabilities. Ability to integrate consulting solutions and services with distribution as part of a commercialization bundle. Invest in innovation to drive further uh, differentiation. Okay. Building the next generation of solutions, areas of focus, clinical trial services. Okay. Areas of focus, clinical trial services, patient access and adherence, clinical practice efficiency, supply chain excellence, digital commerce, home health, internal investment and capability building. Investing to support customer needs to ensure continued leadership positions in key areas. Focus on continue, continual improvement and building on our strengths. Leveraging strategic partnerships and venture capital to support innovation. Okay. So are they actually investing, right? Do they have their own uh, VC arm in the company? Uh, and this is also the thing with VC uh, or strategic VC, right? This is what they'll be considered as, as a strategic VC compared to a financial VC, uh, which is the Sequoia uh, of the world. So the problem with that is, uh, or the situation with that is that once a company takes um, capital from a strategic VC, there are also a lot of strings attached, even if it's not explicitly stated, right? Because ultimately, the the intention of the company that is making the investment uh, is going to be uh, looking for a strategic uh, value out of that investment. Uh, they're going to be asking for a board, so you know they're going to have a board seat on the company, and that's going to help direct uh, product development in many cases, right? So they're going to push for the things that matter to them. And you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line, when the company is a bit more mature, they're doing uh, you know a lot more revenue. They're considering an exit. And there's not a lot more. Uh, you know, there's not you know potentially a lot of buyers on the market, right? Even you know, as an IPO, I mean, there might not be a lot of options. So it does, uh, you know, it does bring that investment, that company closer to the investing company. In that case, uh, potentially limiting the exit opportunities, which allows them to buy at a much favorable valuation compared to if they were purely backed by more of a financial VC. So this, in some ways, it is good for uh, the company that is doing the investing. Uh, so I'd be curious to understand a bit more, uh, right, are these their companies, are these the portfolio companies, and to, you know, how is it helping them uh, achieve the goals that they're trying to do, right? And maybe this is the way that they are hedging their current business, right? The current business that they're in, it's very uh, monolithic, it's very diversified, there's a lot of, uh, you know, in some ways, low-tech offerings uh, across their value proposition, and they're defending that to the best of their ability. They're investing uh, in that as well. But uh, but the upside, right? How are they going to uh, transcend above and beyond it? And maybe that's you know the way that they're doing it is through these partnerships. They're doing it through venture capital uh, to really uh, prevent uh, potentially uh, you know a, a startup from Silicon Valley coming in and taking their lunch from the bottom up. Uh, of the market, so that might be their way of uh, protecting their market share and hedging against uh, technologies that might be a threat. Driving innovation with technology and talents, enterprise fabric, cloud, data analytics, product mentality, horizontal mindset, okay, investing in enterprise capabilities, serve multiple commercial and corporate functions, uh, implementing cloud strategy, uh, review full, uh, full review of current data assets, data liquidity needs, right? I can only imagine the mountain of data that they are generating across their, you know, their customers, um, portfolio, right? And this might even be, you know, even though it is the third in the line, this might even be the true value that they have, right? I mean, going into the next 10, 20 years, AI, machine learning, your ability to compete is also going to be based on how proprietary your data is. With a pharmacy alone, you know, that data is not that valuable, right, to the pharmacy itself. But if there's a consolidator, uh, if there's a natural consolidator of the, of the data, if the company is acting as a middle person and they're naturally collecting that data, they're the ones that are going to have that data and they're going to have, they're able to generate more insights from that and commercialize it and make decisions that are proprietary, that is more, has a structural advantage over others that don't have this data, right? So this might be, this might be very interesting and we should keep a closer eye out for it. Product mentality, increasing maturity in product management functions, okay, leadership competencies, supporting enterprise leadership models that are focused on innovation, diversity, and inclusion, horizontal mindset, not much I'm getting from anything else. Uh, innovation in action, clinical trial navigator. So we have the sponsor at the top, clinical practice at the bottom. So we have protocol explorer, scenario planning, protocol feasibility assessment, okay, protocol design assistance, advanced IQ. Is that the technology that they have? Uh, is that the navigator? Uh, I think we should look into that a bit more. Site assist, search insights, site identification search, 
slightly shortest in the of dashboard, patient finder, patient identification search, patient screening, uh, machine learning, patient matching. That's interesting, right? Can they match the patient biomarkers? Like, is that even possible? Can they match the patient profile so they have a higher efficacy with the, the drug in question? Recruiting tools, patient enrollment. I mean, that itself is pretty interesting. I, I mean, I don't have a full understanding of how clinical trials are really designed and how the protocols and how the workflow happens. So I think, you know, it'd be worth looking into more what, you know, what this actually does, right? Like how much value does it bring? Uh, is it more of linear, linear value or does it actually provide uh, a quantum leap in terms of time savings, in terms of clinical trial success? Uh, that would be good to understand. Innovation in action, track cell, accelerate gene therapy, speed to therapy using cutting edge technologies, enhancing hub patient services and care team connectivity for gene cell and gene therapies. Okay. So as mentioned earlier, I don't have a full and good understanding of gene therapy and cell therapy. So uh, we'll probably have to, come, have to come back and you know, do a bit more research and understand what this does more. AP Marketplace. Our first online marketplace connects from the store suppliers with providers across the country. Okay. So is this like a Amazon dedicated for their customers, right? So for the pharmacies, for the providers, for the you know the clinics, and they will plug them into, and they will match them or allow the bio, uh, pharma, pharmaceutical companies or manufacturers post their products on the marketplace and do direct uh, sales to uh, the end users. I mean, that could be really interesting, right? I mean, going after more of a marketplace model. And I think it'd be good to understand you know, what does the current distribution look like, right? I mean, with Henry Shine, it sounds like the majority of their sales is still in person, it's over the phone, possibly even mail orders, right? I know some companies still do that. You know, healthcare as a whole, I mean, from what I've seen, uh, in different aspects of it, it is very uh, archaic, right? You have the fax machine still, you have, uh, you know, a lot of paper charts where clinics don't use any sort of e-marks, they just take notes on paper. So, you know, even though the marketplace technology has been around forever since the onset of internet, it could be now that they're really only adopting this and uh, the upside could be phenomenal, right? I mean, there could be a lot of savings on personnel that's manually taking orders in. If they can, they can self-serve and automate that process to ordering uh, and collect more data that way, that could be very interesting, right? So let's see, uh, let's take a closer look, uh, you know, if that is actually what it's doing uh, or if it's something else and how far along are they in this initiative. Building on a strong financial connection to drive sustainable growth and shareholder value. Okay, so we have the EVP and CFO, Jim Cleary. Fiscal 2022 highlights strategic and fiscal 2022 highlights strategic, operational, and financial strong institution and momentum across business, supporting global response to global um, to COVID-19 pandemic, including distributing COVID-19 treatments in the U.S. and supporting vaccinations and testing outside the U.S. Successful integrating Alliance Healthcare acquisition. Okay, so they're saying it is uh, the acquisition has innovation is successful. Be good to understand you know, how is that being measured. Here we have the EPS guidance at least high teens percentage growth adjusted. Okay, so that's the operating income. And there's about two to two point five billion dollars of adjusted free cash flow guidance. Okay, so two to two point five billion dollar free cash flow guidance and the training at about I think it's eighty eight billion dollars in uh, as of right now. So okay, purpose and talent uh, released six global sustainability and ESG reporting index submitted science based targets to science based target initiative for validation, science and validation, performance empowerment principles. Okay, delivering long term sustainable growth, which is the EPS twelve percent CAGR since twenty uh, sixteen. Uh, 10% excluding COVID contribution, okay. So we have COVID contribution as about, you know, it's only, uh, it's a very small portion of 2021. Uh, I mean, if the charts are accurate, accurate uh, then it's look, it looks like it's accounting for less than 5% even of the total. So the financial benefits of the of COVID will deteriorate over time, but it's only accounting for, for such a small portion of the EPIs or the earnings uh, that it's, um, yeah, it's negligible. So that's that's good. Uh, sustainable adjusted free cash flow generation and growth, okay. So we have 11% CAGR since 2017, that's good. Uh, value creation, Creating capital deployment strategy. So five-year cumulative capital deployment. Okay, so this is for the past five years. Uh, strong focus on return on investment capital, average return on investment capital in the high teens from fiscal 17 to fiscal 2021. Over 12.4 billion invested, enabled by our strong free cash. Over 12.4 billion invested, enabled by our strong free cash flow. Okay, so okay, so for MA, that's uh, that's a lot, right? Um, but the fact that they are doing share repurchases, dividends. Uh, I think the dividends might be, uh, it might be consistent, right? Like they might have a uh, pretty consistent dividend policy. Uh, this is seems to be indicated here. Uh, so that so we'll look into that, right? So that might be mandatory. And then for uh, share repurchases, that I believe is to be more opportunistic. So I think especially during COVID or 2020, 2020 there might, I mean, I think a lot of companies they might have thought their share price uh, dropped too much. And perhaps if their cash balance is good, uh, that's what triggered this repurchase. And then for the CapEx, uh, it seems that they are reinvesting into the company quite a bit uh, in proportion to the other factors compared to, you know, company like Henry Schein, where it's kind of for a very small portion of the total capital allocation. Uh, I mean, I'm of the opinion, most of the time that acquisitions, M&A, they do cost more than if you know what you're doing and then you're building out the businesses from within. But then there's also issues. I mean, there are also bottlenecks in that if, let's say, the Alliance Healthcare, they have a, a very large network of pharmacies across uh, Europe, 
you're not really going to be able to build that out because the leases are locked in, the locations are good, so you know you can't really build that out. But if you have a single location or you know one location and really expanding on that, you know that could make more sense with the capex reinvestment. So uh, M&A does make sense where you know, where you can't really build or take over leases or uh, there are bottlenecks to growth. But if uh, you know, I think but from the numbers that we're looking at here, they are reinvesting quite a bit in companies. So that's a that's a really good sign. Well, position to create long-term growth, long-term value creation, focus on operating income growth. It's interesting that they're choosing operating income as the focus, not that it's uh, you know they're not choosing revenue, they're not choosing uh, free cash flow, they're not choosing cash flow from operations. Uh, but actually operating income growth, leverage scale and efficiency, leading customer partnerships, leader in specialty, differentiated bio from manufacturer services, leadership in annual health. I think that's going to be a bigger, bigger one as a lot of developed countries. This could actually be really big for them, right? Because right now it seems that the majority of the revenue is coming from the United States and Europe. Uh, I know in Asia, you know, Japan, China, South Asia, I mean, there is a growing middle class, which allows them to forward and look into companion animals, companion pets as uh, part of daily life. And that could be, I mean, their entry into those markets are successful. That could become a very good leg of growth uh, for this company as a whole. And then we have value enhancing capital deployment. Okay. Baseline for long-term growth, 20, uh, fiscal 2022, adjusted earnings. Long-term growth outlook, adjusted operating income. Okay, so 5 to 8%, US is 5 to 8%, international 5 to 8% as well. This is actually pretty interesting because from the way that I'm interpreting, I'm interpreting things and understanding is that the US market is a mature one of, or a very established one for them. So 8 to 5 to 8% does make sense, but it seems that they are weak or allocating capital to Europe or to international projects. Uh, and they were talking about uh, higher margin services and businesses. And you know, I'm curious why this is only they're projecting five to eight percent here as well, right? I would imagine this is over ten percent, or eight to ten, or even fifteen percent. So I'm curious to understand where this is. You know, why this isn't higher? And if we're capital deployment, they're increasing by three to four percent, which makes sense. Inflation may more or less be in that range, probably a bit higher over the next year or so, but long term probably in that range. And then we have adjusted EPS, eight to twelve percent growth per annum. Growth drivers in U.S. healthcare solutions, building on established leadership positions, long-term strategic partnerships with key end customers across all channels. Okay, that makes sense. Leadership in specialty distribution and biopharma manufacturing services differentiates our upstream and downstream uh, position. Favorable market trends we talked about biosimilars. I'd be also interested to know how their revenue looks like compared to uh, when comparing biosimilars, lower value and lower price tag drugs versus the more higher ticket and proprietary drugs that are branded. Right? Do they make less? Is it percentage of sales or is it that it's you know per mile traveled for transport? Is it per dollar? Uh, received for you know a certain amount of uh, unit quantity volume, or is it actually a percentage of the total sales? Right, that'd be important to know. Leadership in animal health supported by favorable long-term trends for both the companion and production animal markets. Growth drivers in international healthcare solutions leveraging global scale and naming capabilities, leading pan-European wholesaler and complementary solutions provider. Okay, so are they in? So are they? You know, are they the top wholesaler? Are they the top solutions provider in their space already in Europe? That'd be interesting to know. Innovative provider of upstream biopharma manufacturer services, including range of key market services and solutions, global specialty logistics leader helping support pharmaceutical clinical trials and deliver pharmaceutical shipment on time and in temperature, robust portfolio of downstream product solutions. Incremental growth drivers from capital deployment, deploying strong free cash flow to drive returns on returns, strategic discipline approach to MA, financing our business imperatives, opportunistic share repurchases, including the new board uprising to repurchase one billion dollar in sales. Uh, be interested to know has that happened already or has it bound to happen. We'll see. Enabled by free, a strong free cash flow generation with adjusted free cash flow up to, uh, to $2.5 billion in fiscal 2022. Okay. Value creation drivers. Okay. So I think I've covered a lot of these already. So leading customer partnerships in key areas, including retail, specialty, health systems, and animal health in the United States and Europe. Okay. Focus on margins. Higher growth, higher margin businesses contribute positively, positively to consolidated margins, diligent upstream and downstream contracting to reflect value proposition, discipline, expense management, leveraging scale and efficiency. Focus on return on invested capital, legacy of strong returns, investment in business innovation to drive business efficiencies and deliver unique solutions. Okay. Strong balance sheet paying down two thirds of the lines healthcare acquisition debt by March 2022, enabled by free cash flow. So I think this, uh, you know, does that make sense, right? Does that make sense that they're paying down debt? Let's see the cost of it, right? The cost of debt is only 3%, 4%. It might make sense to hold it on a balance sheet, helping lower the overall with the uh, average cost of capital and perhaps even distribute that to in the form of dividends or share repurchases, right? I mean, it might be you know, better for the company from an investment perspective to keep that on books, but you know, let's look into why they are doing that. Why are they paying down the debt versus you know, giving it back to the investors? Commitment to maintain strong investment grade, credit ratings, balance between internal investment, strategic and optimistic share repurchases, maintain reasonable dividend. So, okay, so just going back to this. So the fact that they might, the reason, you know, the possible reasons that why they are paying that down is to maintain the investment grade credit rating. So perhaps it's the, you know, the amount of debt in proportion to the amount of free cash flow that it is generating. It's, you know, it may affect their credit rating, right? So you know, let's, let's take a look at, let's take a look at that. Okay, so here we have the earnings per share, so very consistent growth. And here we have employee severance, litigation, and other, and I think this is in billions. So I don't think that's coming from severance, that's probably from litigation. And 17, we had another one of smaller amounts. Okay, so the EPS seems to be very consistent. I would actually expect more variability, given, uh, I would actually expect more, I expected more variability in the EPS, especially that the adjustments here, they're not accounting for COVID, right? So I mean, even though COVID, I believe it is a very small, you know, small percentage of your overall business, it seems from the prior slides, the fact that 
you know, they helped the vaccines, they helped the drug distributions during those years. You know, why didn't we see, you know, why are we not seeing bigger impacts? Or maybe this isn't bigger impacts. Some kind of targeted EPS. Okay, so yeah, I mean, let's, uh, well, take a closer look at, you know, why the numbers are the way they are. Right? I mean, this is very, very linear in growth. And we have the reconciliations from stock options, adjust the free cash flow, right? So here, okay, so this is, you know, see, so this is in millions. So from the looks of it, this is, okay, so this is not billion, this is $27. Uh, per share. Uh, overall, operating cash flows has been very consistent. It was a big jump in 2019. I mean, almost double. I mean, that's like an 80% increase. But, you know, this actually fell short. So it'll be interesting to understand why that is the case, right? Was it a, because something that happened in accounts receivables or accounts payables? You know, we'll take a closer look. So just free cash flows. So after adjustments, just free cash flows. Okay, it's so after adjustments. And then we have the just free cash flows. So, so very consistent as well. It's very consistent even during COVID times. Okay, so here we have capital deployment. So we have very consistent capital expenditures. Uh, that's a good sign. Uh, merchants acquisition. So it doesn't seem that they are deal junkies, right? I mean, they are buying companies, you know, every year it seems they're not big acquisitions until 2021. And that might be due to really cheap assets or really cheap companies, distressed assets that are on the books or on, on the market. I'd be interested to know, you know, what kind of price they got Alliance Healthcare at, right? Was it a, a normal sale? Probably not if they sold during 2021. They might have been distressed. I'm curious to know what they pay for it. Dividends, very consistent. Okay. I would imagine they have they would have bought more in 2021 or even 2020. Or they might have thought that the cash balance on the books might have been a better use of capital being used for acquisition instead of giving back to investors, right? That's a, that's a possibility. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, so that's the end of it. Overall, I think that financially, they seem to be doing very well. The position that they have in the market seems to be very strong. And the fact that their size and scale is, from the sound of it, a structural competitive advantage that they have over other you know, other uh, companies on the market. So I think they are very good in where they are right now. But we have to understand the vulnerabilities in their business model. Uh, what happens if smaller companies uh, that are more specialized technology companies that offer a better user experience, start shipping away at you know the higher margin or higher growth businesses where you can add your fun fundamental core distribution business. How is that going to affect them and how far and how fast would that uh, start to come down, right? But at the same time, that's a very difficult mode to crack. I think on the basis of just their traditional business, if they're purely competing on distribution, I mean, that's kind of, you know, I, I can't see a scenario where that is easily done. So overall, I think it's a very good company. You know, I think it's worth taking a look at, you know, the financial performance. You know, as of today, October 24, uh, 24 in 2023, uh, I believe the market cap of this company is about $88 billion. Whereas Henry Shang, I think the free cash flow was only five seven hundred thousand dollars or five to seven hundred million dollars and their market cap was of a higher amount, slightly at eighty nine billion. So, you know, either one is overvalued or the other is undervalued, if that is comparable at all, right? They're both in the distribution business. Uh, I think this is generating a much higher revenue compared to Henry Shine, but of the revenue of the two hundred billion dollars of revenue that they are generating, how much of that is actual revenue versus billing that they're collecting, right? In some cases. So let's see how they are reporting the revenue. Let's see, you know, what's the reason for uh, the discrepancy in the valuation. So yeah, let's make a you know a very simple DCF and start looking at if the share price is uh, very value, overvalued, or undervalued.